Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is, I guess it's Tuesday, the 28th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And uh, yesterday it was rather cold here. I got up to about 28 degrees. It's a little cold for this time of year. You know, that's one thing about the climate change thing. It's true, the climate always is changing. Some years it's hot, other times it's cold. Some years we have no snow, some years we get we, about March, it'll dump about two or three feet on us. It's that way all over the place. I mean, around here, people say, oh, it's so cold. I said, you, you've never been to Minot, North Dakota in the winter. <laughs> oh, yes. I can still feel it in my face if I think about it. Uh-huh. All right, so what do I want to talk about? We'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, I'm still uh, Sunday at church, at, at quote-unquote church, which is the best one I could find. But it it's, was so impoverished. They had a guest speaker that didn't know what he was doing, making everything into law, Just doesn't understand the gospel. Baptists apparently don't understand the gospel. The, the problem is, if it was just him, but it reminded me, this is the pattern I've seen all my life, especially among Baptists, fundamentalist Baptists, evangelical Baptists, Southern Baptists, whatever they are, wherever they're going, I don't know. Although a couple of years ago, the, 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 the wimpy ones left, President Carter left, and because they were, uh, he was liberal. He was, he, Carter and his wife fully supported abortion and LGBTQ. It didn't have the Q on that. In fact, it was just not even LGBT <laughs> back in those days. Uh, but let's see where this goes. Uh, but I'm, isn't there a place I can worship together with my brothers and sisters and engage in real worship? Why can't you have songs that a person that you can actually worship in spirit and truth to? Hymns, great songs. You know, there's hymns in hymn in almost all hymn, hymnals that go back a thousand years. A thousand years, Christians have been singing this stuff. Oh no, we got to make up something fresh. Just like the charismatics and the, you know, they got to have that fresh word from God. The old stuff isn't good enough. Man is not good enough. We want those quail and those leeks and onions and fish that we used to love in Egypt. God, give us the food of the world, not your heavenly manna. We're tired of it. Yeah. The problem with, with the, the Baptists in general is their salvation is so inadequate. It's flimsy. It, yeah, they believe that you're saved from sin. You're, you're forgiven your sins. And through faith. But they don't, but after that, they live their life by works, by principle. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Build your, build your own relationship with God. Essentially is what they're saying. Prayer is a work. You must set aside so many minutes or so many hours a day. You must do this and this and this and home uh, devotions and yada, 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 yada. If they're not miserable, they're not happy. So I would hate to be married to them. Is marriage a work? Or a joy. Uh, the same thing with Christ. Is 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 your relationship with him a joy just because you know him and you know what he's done for, for you and uh, you just are in love with Christ? Or is it something you have to work at? Force yourself to pray instead of having the privilege to come before the very throne of God. Whenever you want. Oh, no, I've got my prayer times here. And let me say, there you can get into a habit. Like, I like to get out 
out in God's creation, away from people. I don't want to even see a person. Somebody, I see somebody coming down the trail or something, like, oh, they interrupt my prayer. I mean, and I do not pray in prayer groups. No way, Jose. I just don't do it. Uh, public com communal prayer and worship, that's okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're actually praying personally to God. It's personal. It's personal. What are you, the NSA? You put these three spies around here with? I don't want, you know, what will happen if you're in a, something like that? is you start thinking about what are they thinking about what I'm praying rather than focusing on God, on Christ. I, these are the inventions of man. Where does the Bible tell you to do that? What did Jesus say? Go into your closet, into your own room, into its, your place, wherever that place is, that's nobody around. The point is, by yourself with God. He'd go up on top of a hill. He'd leave his disciples and go up on top of a hill or whatever, whatever, just to get away from everybody. And then he would pray to his father in secret. It's what he taught us to do. Why don't we listen to Jesus? Good question. Because we don't seem to listen very well. Dispensationalists would say, oh, that's in the gospel. That doesn't apply to the church. Yeah, it's like they say that the church was an unknown mystery. There's nothing about the church in the Old Testament, which is what bankrupts them, because the, all the the, the uh, promises of the new covenant and what that entails is given us in the prophets in the Old Testament. Oh, that's not for us. That's just for the, the natural people of Israel, which are all unbelievers practically. No, unbelievers do not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that system is so messed up, and it causes—it's uh, not just about prophecy. It's, it's a, it, it eviscerates the gospel. It, it's satanic. It eviscerates the power of the gospel. You know, Satan plays this game with us. Because he knows if he'll just do one thing over here, and then we'll react and go all the way over the other side. It's like the, the charismatic movement. He'll throw out these, this, this vomit of Satan over here, and everybody will go running off the edge of the cliff on the other side to get away from it. And they'll, they'll, they'll go into rationalism, which is debt, <laughs> to flee from the, the spiritism over here. And they simply ignore the Holy Spirit altogether. It, it, Christianity is 100% supernatural. If your Christianity isn't supernatural, if it's just rational, if it's just, you're dead. What is the mark of a Christian? That you've been baptized in water? Uh, that you, you, you said something? That you believe certain doctrines? No. Where does Paul, what does Paul say about that? The Apostle Paul. Know you not that the Spirit of Christ is in you? If any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He doesn't belong to Christ. Does, does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? If not, you're not his. And the, what Paul is saying there, don't you recognize this? So you should be able to know that. And it has nothing at all to do with speaking in gibberish, which is what these tongues are they talk about. Day of Pentecost, they were known languages. People heard them speaking in their own native language. Jews, unbelievers. If that's not what you're doing, you're not speaking in tongues. It's not from the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered what you're saying? Well, fortunately, it's nothing. How would you know if you weren't cursing Christ and blessing Satan? Since you don't know what you're saying. You ever think about that? How do you know? Jesus said to his, to his disciples once, you know not what spirit you are of. All right, what, should, what mess should I start with? I had some messes in mind. And 
brothers and sisters, you know, I, I feel today like like I you know Abraham wandered in the wilderness. Abraham wandered seeking the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is, is God. There's a classical piece of Christian literature called Pilgrim's Progress. It is an allegory of the Christian life in the form of a dream, written by John Bunyan, who was a uh, famous, uh, well, sort of a Baptist, <laughs> an independent. And he, suffer- he, he was imprisoned in Bedford, county jail for years and years and years and years for preaching the gospel without a license. Persecuted by the state church or the church state, whatever whatever you want to call it, in England for that crime of proclaiming the gospel. See, it was, it was a crime for, for Christians even to gather together outside the official state Anglican church. The church of the king the earthly king, not the heavenly king. <clears throat> and you know what? If it wasn't, this is sort of strange, but the United States with its um, non-establishment of religion saved Protestantism because over there, there were all state churches, and state churches always end up dead and empty. Today, you can go into massive cathedrals in Europe or Scandinavia or England, and you'll see half a dozen people and a state-paid preacher, priest, or whatever up front speaking to a huge cavernous cathedral. Dead. It's completely dead. Church of England is completely dead. Uh, the state Lutheran churches, I don't know, if some of these churches have been disestablished now, but Lutheranism was state religion. Uh, Reform, Calvinism, state religion. All those things are, Ang- of course, Anglicanism, state religion. Just like in the Orthodox world, you, know, the, you had prior to communism. Communism is really the salvation of the Orthodox Church, too. Uh, the disestablishment is still not established over there. Thank God for that. But it was the church of the czar, the Caesar. See, czar is just another word for Caesar. And it was the, the Orthodox, uh, it was comes from Constantine and through the, the imperial church. <clears throat> Dead. Dead. It's wedded to the world, Babylon the Great. Supposed to be the bride of of Christ, commits fornication with the kings of the world. Christian nationalism is the same thing, Babylon the Great. Roman Catholicism, Babylon the Great. It is not Christ. It is also the man of sin because it exalts itself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, all that is venerated. It's like the Pope. He's above it all. You have to hear me. These these prophets and apostles in the NAR-style movement that began to come out in about the 1990s, I remember this. When once Bill Hammond began to pump, promote this stuff and others, it went from Wimber to the pit of hell. And this stuff, this stuff began to raise its head, and I didn't know. I was looking at this stuff, and considering it, and I was half charismatic, one foot in it. Why, why, how did I get into it? Because the Baptist church I was going to was so dead. Dead. Did they believe in Jesus? Yes. Did they believe in the Bible? Yes. But spiritually, well, they had been wounded by immorality of the previous pastor, but still, it, they turned. Here's a, as a as a new Christian, saved out of utter darkness. And Lutheranism was that was that was dead. So the church in my neighborhood, 
and they preach the Bible, right? And, and they would actually go around and try to get people to come. Well, they did once upon a time, at least. But uh, so I started going there. But the worship, they had a worship leader that turned joy into a funeral dirge. He was up there, and he'd, he'd, he'd slow everything down to it was simply mourning. They were perpet in perpetual mourning, mourning over their sins, mourning over the sin. All, you know, that's not Christianity. You're supposed to be saved. Once you're saved, you're supposed to be filled with joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the joy of, of knowing God. What are you mourning about? And out of that, I started going to some of these other churches, including some charismatic ones, looking for something that had some life in it. The Bible is not life. This book can't save you. Only God saves you. This book is a testimony to what God's done. It is not the object of your faith. Christ is the object of your faith. You don't have to have a perfect Bible. All you foolish people out there constantly contending for a per an inerrant, infallible text. Well, there is no such thing. How would you know it if you found it? There, it's thoroughly reliable. But this can't save you. It is a testimony to Christ. It's a testimony to the works of God's. It record of it. The record isn't the thing itself. This is not the word of God. This is the scriptures. Christ is the word of God. Search the scriptures yourself. See what the word of God is. It is Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's the word of God the one who became flesh and dwelt among us and died on the cross for our sins. That is the word of God. That's one thing that Luther had absolutely right. The Bible is to be read Christ-centered. And I have to say that, uh, like the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, they are much more Christ-centered than Baptists are, than Calvinists are than Methodists are, than Nazarenes are, that Pentecostals and Charismatics and, well, these false prophets and stuff, they're just self-centered. See, the, the Pentecostal Charismatic movement is centered on the spirit and gifts of the spirit and prosperity and health, healings, all that stuff, power, power, experiences, Give them an experience and they'll follow you. Induce an experience. These worship, it's all about inducing experiences. I've been there. And I've been demon-possessed before I was saved. You go knocking on the wrong doors. You go unlocking the wrong doors and you will find yourself in bondage. So you don't have to be saved to be into that stuff. Is dangerous. But uh, let me go over the scriptures here. 1 Corinthians. 1 and 2 Corinthians, the books I hate to preach. Some of them. <laughs> there's worse ones. The worst book to ever preach is Job. Oh, Lord. If there's one book I would take out of the Bible... That would be the first one. <laughs> it's like in the New Testament. I mean, it's, it, there's Job. What's Job? You know, I, I it, it, one you have to look. It is mentioned in the New Testament. So it's called righteous Job, but poor Job. And some of the things, it, it, the ideas it can give you about God are a little bit odd. Like God was just he. In that book of Job, God says to the devil, you deceived me. Did you, did you know that? It's like, wait a minute. 
what and there's this God and the devil are using Job, Job as a pawn. It's like really. I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna put a question mark over that. Is is that is sh sh we should we be using that? That's very very ancient book. It it probably goes back to about the time of Abraham, and it's it's not a it's not written by a prophet. It's not part of the books of Moses. So it's one of those things like mm, I don't know. Especially when 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 God is talking to the devil and says, you deceived me. You tricked me into doing this to Job. Uh, a Calvinist could figure that out because that's the kind of God they worship. Sort of. No, they don't. No, their God deceives people. The Calvinist God, it's he's ugly. Stay away from the Calvinism. Most Calvinists have no idea what Calvin actually taught, just like Lutherans have no idea. Luther was much better, though, than—I mean, Luther was Luther. Um, he, he might have been just the right guy for the job, but— uh, Luther had made some major mistakes in his life as a Christian, as a leader. And he uh, and it caused the death of tens of thousands of peasants. There was a uh, the Reformation brought about, uh, in all kinds of places, you had all kinds of things popping up. Uh, uh, there was a uh, a revolution at Munster. It's blamed on the Anabaptists, but those guys weren't Anabaptists. It was a prophetic revolution. There was these guys claiming to be prophets, and they were leading the people into immorality and all kinds of things, and and they used those people to smear the Anabaptists as an excuse to to burn burn us and everything else burned Bible believers that wouldn't submit to the, you know, they were independent. See, they, they did not, uh, the, the state church, they were a threat to the state church because they were real Christians. Some of them were real Christians. And they showed it. It's like, why did they persecute the Christians in the beginning in the New Testament? Because they were real and it's like the why did the priests and the and the scribes seek to kill Jesus because he had power real power and they didn't they were just deadheads so but the, the church is engaged we are quick to condemn the wickedness of the world and the sinners out there um pot we will not look at ourselves. Who is worse, the Christian that violates God's commands, violates the new covenant, violates God's uh, Jesus Christ's express orders to love one another for the sake of our own ambitions and our own pride, or the people out there that engage in all kinds of strange behaviors because they don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know what God has called them to be. And so they try to fill their their empty lives with the flesh. That's a problem to start with. Something that will never satisfy them. So they go deeper and deeper looking for satisfaction and they never find it. They're already in a hell of sorts. But God can save them from that. So what do we do? We condemn them. <laughs> so I want to talk about a little bit, I guess. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 4 here. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God that was given to you by Christ Jesus. In other words, they were saved. But they didn't act like it. 
as he started getting into that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge. Now, here's where we get the speaking of tongues and the prophecies and everything else from, the gifts of these things. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So what were the, the tongues and the prophets confirming? In fact, he warns about false tongues, false prophecies. No one speaking by by Christ can say Christ is is uh, uh, what did he what was it uh, Christ is accursed. You can't condemn Christ while you're speaking uh, as a prophet. In other words, I'd prove you're not a prophet. So was he that they were enriched in everything by him? By the Spirit of Christ, by Christ, in all utterance and knowledge. About who? What does the Holy Spirit testify of? Of Christ. Not about who's going to win the election. Not about uh, other mundane subjects. The Holy Spirit makes gives the things of Christ to us. Not toys to play with. Spiritual gifts are not toys to play with. What's the purpose of them? The unity of the body. Jeepers, what does it do? What are these charismatic gifts to do now? They divide. They don't unify. And then at this time, of course, there was no New Testament. Circulate. It was the apostles themselves circulating around. They can't be everywhere at once. So you were enriched, enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you by the Holy Spirit. Confirming what the, the message of the apostles in them by the gifts of the Spirit. That's not what they do today, in case you haven't noticed. Some of you don't know that. I'm telling you, they don't. I have a witness to these things. I don't mean a YouTube witness. In person, where you can actually... Hey, there's... You know, I don't feel quite right here. It's like I'm a stranger in a strange place. You know, it's like if, if I go to a, to a Catholic service, visit a Catholic worship service. I haven't done that for a bit now. but So I'll be back there uh, with all these people around me, and, and I know they don't belong to Christ. I know it. How do I know it? Because the Spirit of Christ is in me. It's not in them. I don't feel that that bond, that that koinonia, that fellowship, because the Spirit's not in them. The church I've, I've been attending, yeah, I, as far as people there, yeah, they're they're my brothers and sisters, but they're 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 suffering through this impoverished preaching and this impoverished worship. It's like, oh God, help us, deliver us from this stuff. We're living in Caprini Green. Better to be in Gaza worshiping with saints and than in spirit and truth than some of this stuff. So that you came no a short in no gift. What are the purpose of the gifts? To reveal Christ. Not toys to play with eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. What? His return. That's, a, that's what the word apocalypse means. The unveiling of Christ, the return of Christ. The book of Reve It's not the book of Revelations either. It is a, the book about the revelation that is the coming, visible coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say the book of Revelations. No, it's not, it's not what it is. Who will also confirm you to the end. Christ. Who will? Christ. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Day, blameless how? Like the holiness people? No. Standing firm in faith in Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead. His righteousness, not our righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And if you've been convinced otherwise, you've been deceived by Satan. 
even as saints, our flesh will always insert itself. Be, you know, we have mixed motives for the things we do. Our spirit may want to do something for godly reasons, but our flesh is there like, I can use this to exalt myself. Make people look at me, oh, isn't he holy? Isn't he wonderful? And if, if, if you're not aware of that trap, you'll fall into it. I mean, I, I've, I've had experiences with that. I mean, I've, I've had, I mean, I, I visited a church one time, and I, I was involved at the time with, uh, what was I doing? Oh, trying to get, being involved in uh, some of the street people and other things uh, in the area where I had my, ended up having my bookstore building I'd bought over there. Uh, I had no idea that the neighborhood was like that, but I found out. Uh, but somehow the word had gotten around, and I was there, and, and I visiting, and the pastor asked me who I was, and and uh, I told him my name. He said, are you that Stephen Anderson? It's like, like oh. I don't like that. I, I really don't. I, I want to be in the back. I want to be in the back. I want Christ in the front. So when people start thinking you're something great, eh, I, I take that as dangerous. <laughs> to me, to me, it's like, eh, yeah. you realize that if you're a Christian, you say, mm, we have to take a step back here. And like, No, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. <laughs> don't start looking to me as somebody to follow. No, follow Christ. It, if I'm a success on YouTube, it's because my idea of success is if I get you to follow Christ more closely, don't become a disciple of mine, come become a disciple of Christ. If I can help you that way to do that, then I'm successful. Then I thank God that he's used me. But I know it's his work, not mine. Uh, you know, I, I've been a born-again Christian for 47 years, and been wandering in the wilderness for 47 years, too. Uh, like like Abraham, uh, you know, that he was a stranger in a strange land. And that's when I was thinking in my bed when I woke up this morning. That, that's that's what I was feeling like, especially after Sunday. It's like, oh. Getting desperate. Get, I, you know what it is? I thought about it. I'm homesick. I'm homesick. I'm looking... For the same thing Abraham was, the city that has a foundation whose builder and maker is God. But we're in the new covenant. The kingdom is come in the church. Not come to the world yet, but it's come in the church. But we're not walking. You know, there's a lot of people out there talking about the kingdom, but they don't know what it is. Christ is the king. We have him by faith. We are now seatedly, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because we're in Christ Jesus by faith. We just have to walk by faith and not try to do it by works, like trying to live our principles. Boy, that annoyed me. It's like, oh, here we go again. I've heard that so many times. I just want to weep, but my eyes are dry. So let's go back to the scriptures here. God is faithful. Yes, he is. By whom by whom you were called. Some people have been called by men or women, not by God. Who were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I have to say that that Lutherans I'm talking about real Lutherans, not the ones that have gone utterly apostate, are more Christ-centered than Baptists are. Why? I don't know. Something's wrong there. More Christ-centered. It's more focused on him. Even Catholics are more focused on Christ, if you take Mary out of the picture. It's not, you know, 
Fundamentalists and evangelicals are too Bible-focused and not enough Christ-focused. And I'm not disparaging this book. I mean, I've done a lot. To, it's just utterly dependable. But it is a witness to Christ. This is a witness to Christ. We don't worship this. This is not our life. This is a testimony to Christ. Christ is our life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not the Bible in you. Christ in you. You know, like, like the, the new, the, when I read like Paul's epistles or John's or whatever, what do I see? I see Christ ever more clearly. I have not plumbed the depths by any means, but gradually it's getting a little brighter and a little brighter as God works in me. The words of Jesus are in this book. The words of the apostles are still with us in this book. We don't need more apostles. We've got the original ones, not these fakes. The, the, the great words of the prophets are in this book. Everything that speaks about Christ, that's what's important in this book. You know, Job, eh. <laughs> some things speak more clearly of Christ than others. So <clears throat> let's go back, get to my point over here in this uh, Oh, wrong one. There we go. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name in his name. Paul's saying this, pleading in his name, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there, somebody's been tattling here, <laughs> Chloe's household, say, some people, hey, Paul, there's something going on here that you might be concerned about. Does he rebuke Chloe for this? No. Not at all. Chloe's household, that there are, there are contentions among you. Now, I say this. Each one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, that's Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name, made disciples of himself rather than of Christ. Yes, also I baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other for Christ did not send me to baptize, some denominations don't know this either, but to preach the gospel. Why? Because baptism isn't the power of God unto salvation. The message of the gospel is what the gospel is about, which is Christ. Christ and Christ crucified. That's the gospel. He died for our sins. That's the good news. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That's why I don't polish my stuff. Paul was accused of having despicable speech. I know it's hard to listen to me, especially when I'm trying to think at the same time and trying to speak. It doesn't all come out right. Sometimes I, you know, I, sometimes I'm talking to my wife, and I, I, I could swear I said one thing, but she said, no, you said something else. I said, really? But I've learned from watching myself reviewing a video or something that, yeah, that can happen. Should I go fix it all? No. I'm a vessel of clay. Let you, let you all see, let you know that I am nothing but a vessel of clay. So I leave it the way it is. Because it's Christ, not myself. I don't want to be make myself appear perfect when I'm not. Christ, 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 Christ crucified. If I'm preaching something else, not preaching the right thing preaching somebody else. 
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Yeah, it is. They don't want to hear it. They don't care. What's this? It's nonsense. Don't worry. You don't have to defend your the, Jesus against all these foolish people out there that say, ah, oh, the Bible's all nonsense. It's all made up. Well, that's what they want to believe. Let them perish in their unbelief. Christ doesn't go chasing after him. Why should you? If you don't want to believe, that's your business. No skin off my nose. I I belong to him. It's just foolishness. You know, the only the only problem it is that I don't want to see you perish. But if you want to perish, that's your choice. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Oh, this isn't about uh, salvation being a process in a person, although in a sense it is. This is about the church, the, the, all those that are being gathered together, us who are being saved. Uh, not the idea that, that salvation is a continual thing in the sense that coming into Christ is a slow and gradual process or anything like that. No, you're either saved or not. Either Christ is in you or you're not. The process, sanctification, growth in Christ, growth in the knowledge of Christ and in maturity and in learning to walk by faith, that's an ongoing work uh, of God. Sanctif separating us to God. We're sub and continually perfecting us. The Holy Spirit's got a, a really difficult job. He has to turn us into the spotless bride of Christ. What, what do you want that job? That might, you know, sometimes washing clothes, removing spots is difficult and a, 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 uh, requires pressure and scrubbing. And uh, so don't be surprised. You know, there, there may be purposes for the church going through tribulation. Because the purpose is to present Christ with a spotless bride. Not a lackluster, faithless, I really don't care if I get married or not, kind of bride. No, someone that's eager and wants to embrace him fully. So if, if we have to go through a little laundry work, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters. I'm fully willing to escape that, but 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 what is what serves God's interest? Is that what are, is in our heart? Are are we interested in ourselves and and not having to endure what the church has always endured, tribulation uh, and suffering? You'll be persecution for the name of Christ. Are, are would we? Are we so unsaved, unsanctified in our hearts that that we're not concerned about what glorifies God and what is the the what's in His interest? Are, are we still so so childish in Christ that we're putting our interests above His and our interest to avoid pain and suffering like? Does God deliberately inflict pain? No. But he needs to do some rough scrubbing, I think. And currently, you know, so as Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find the faith on the earth? I look today at the churches and think, well, how come they don't even know what the new covenant is? <laughs> they don't know what Jesus bought for us. How can you live victoriously without knowing that? How can you live by faith if you don't know what the promises are? the sure and certain promises of Christ in the new covenant. If you don't know those, how can you live by faith? Oh, you're going to live by principles. Good luck with that. That's living by law. By the works of law shall no flesh be justified. For by the works of law comes the knowledge of sin. So I'm not praying enough. I'm not rejoicing enough. I'm a sinner. I'm hopeless. I'm a sinner. So everything you try to do by principle just condemns you. Foolish pastors out there. They don't know the gospel. And this is, I mean, this is rampant among Baptists. 
I'm sure it's among other places too, but I can't speak to every, I've never been in a part of a, you know, per, a Presbyterian, but I do know about them. <laughs> I do know Calvin. It's like, er. I don't think I would find it there either. I would find law among Calvinists. And that's the, the reform, the, the Calvinism among Baptists are trying to push law. This, this is Christian nationalism. It's nothing but law. It's dead state religion. We had over a thousand years of that. Do we need more? Did it work? Did Christ come back during the reign of the popes? The Antichrist? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. How many people were saved then? You can be saved as a Catholic only through faith in Christ alone. If your trust is in him, but if it's in the institution of the church, if it's in the sacraments, you're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sins because your faith is not in Christ. And if you don't have faith that abides, it's just temporary. Well, Jesus talked about that in the parable of the seed and the field, the soils. Lots of times there's temporary life, but only the good soil produces a harvest. What's the harvest? Eternal life. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not something. The, the tree that grows the fruit of the Spirit doesn't have to labor to produce the fruit. It does it out of its own nature. Because you are, if you're a born-again Christian, you are a partaker in the divine nature. Why don't I hear that preached either? Because people are afraid to preach it. There are promises that are so great in the Scriptures, people are afraid to preach them. Lest they be, see, you know, they be accused of some terrible crime. The divine fusus, the nature, the very nature of God. Paul, uh, Peter says we are partakers of that. Christ in us, that's the way Paul puts it, the hope of glory. Even Calvin said we're in union with Christ, union in Christ. That was uh, one of his best sayings. He looked at the gospel as being saved as being in a state of union with Christ, and that is correct. Of course, you can be mentally wrong and right and wrong in all kinds of other ways. In some ways he was right, but he would just, it's like Luther. He was, Luther, these guys were all Calvinists, or Catholics. So they had been imbued with the Roman Catholicism all their lives, like Luther. And then he starts seeing there's, he's got this problem, like his sin. He can't get rid of his sin. He keeps feeling guilty all the time because he is guilty. And then he discovers the just shall live by faith. And he says, like the doors of heaven open to me his expression. But yet, you know, Luther Luther was still a, a man of flesh. You know, as we all are, we still have bodies of flesh. Our bodies haven't been redeemed yet. We're not sinlessly perfect, if you haven't noticed. Even Paul was not sinful, sinlessly perfect, as we shall see. So what what is this What's this? He's he's begging the church at Corinth not to divide up into denominations, not to be all speak the same thing. What's the same thing we're to speak? Christ. So, what's this deal with confessional Christianity, where the most of the confession? I mean, other than the uh, the, the Protestant confessions. One of the slogans of the Protestant was Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Good. That's our authority, Scripture. That's the objective authority. People can say, well, I, I feel this, or, you know, somebody, uh, an angel told me that. Well, what how we determine if that's true? Could things like that happen? Yeah. Does it agree with this book? If it's something different that's not in this book, you know what it was. It wasn't a spirit from God at all. We are to judge things in the church. Somebody, somebody says, uh, judge not lest you be judged, but God says that we are to judge 
those in the church. Well, if somebody quotes that, which the, the world loves it so much, just ask them, have you read the context? Would you like me to read the context of that to you? They'll shut up right away. They will shut up. Because uh, that's the Sermon of the Mount, and it will condemn them thoroughly. They don't want to hear what Christ has to say. They say that because they don't want to hear what you have to say. Do not judge. Why? What do they mean? They're, feel, they're starting to feel guilty. They're starting to be condemned. Well, who's the one that's job is to condemn them? Not you, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes out into the world. Jesus said, when he is come, he will convict the world of sin, of a particular sin, brothers and sisters, of not believing in Christ. And of righteousness, because Christ has gone to the Father. In other words, what righteousness is, because we don't have Christ, who is the righteousness of God, in front of us to say. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, because the ruler of this world, the God of this age, Satan, has already been condemned. He's awaiting the execution of his sentence. You know, like the person that's been judged and condemned, and then is put in jail awaiting the final execution of the sentence. The final execution is to be tossed into the lake of fire. But he'll be locked up for a thousand years in that in-between period. Uh, yeah, God has a final purpose for him, to test the world after the, to the thousand years to see if they are... Uh, really followers of him or not. Yeah, they circle around the, what, the, he gathers the armies of the world, Gog and Magog, by the way, that's the only New Testament reference to Gog and Magog, that's in Ezekiel 38, against the camp of the saints. And what happens? Fire comes down from heaven, consumes them, the fire of the, of the abyss, probably. The same kind of fire that rained down on good old Sodom and Gomorrah. Eternal flames is called in the New Testament. Eternal fire. So here we have these denominations dividing. So, you know, Protestants, how, can you be a confessional church and be sola scriptura? Isn't that oxymoronic? Because what's the standard? There's a new denomination, by the way, called G3. And uh, it's, they say they're not a denomination, but they have everything a denomination has. They have money, or a fee, membership fee, required annual con contributions, just like they're really Southern Baptists with a different name. They're doing the same thing. Uh, so they have a standard of fellowship called the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Uh, they have uh, programs that they offer instruction that they offer, and they have uh, fellowship that they offer, uh, conferences, things like this. And they have, again, a, a, an annual uh, contribution minimum of $500 and the statement of faith. And uh, what else do they have? Oh, they have leadership too. So that fit, as far as the IRS is concerned, you're a denomination. That is, a, they said, well, we're not a denomination. We're just a network. Now you're a denomination. Uh, you're, exact, you're like a carbon copy of the Southern Baptists. Just a lot smaller. And you're Reformed. Calvinists. Uh, so it's a Calvinistic, another Calvinist Baptist denomination. Whether you call yourself that or not. What are you doing? You're dividing yourself from the body of Christ. You have a standard other than God's word, other than Christ. What's going on at Corinth? They were saying, well, I'm of Paul. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Well, you're dividing them. G3 is like this newborn denomination. That's not. They say, well, we're not a denomination. Yes, you are. Legally, you are. Uh, you meet all the requirements of the IRS for one. So here's, again, I sort of miss the, uh, the kind of worship in the Lutheran church. It, was, it's, it is more serious, and it's more Christ-centered in some ways, than uh, 
than Baptists. Baptists are frivolous when it comes to worship. Frivolous. My mother was right. They're frivolous. Scandalized her when her friend took her to a Baptist church. Frivolous. I mean, so, so they're talking to each other before the service. Okay, there, there's nothing against that in the Scripture. But if you take 15 minutes out of worship to to engage in frivolous chit-chat with each other and call that fellowship, excuse me, that's not fellow. You don't know what fellowship is. You need to be you need to be schooled in the scriptures. Uh, what it is is this is what people like. It's just like all these different kinds of worship and everything else. Well, we like that. You know, it's like the uh, uh, one of the the uh, the cowboy churches. I'm sure they're still around someplace. For a while, they were a big thing. So you worship in a barn, sitting on hay bales. I don't have any problems with that at all. But if you have to have that style. Is there a good reason you do that? Or just to be stylish, to be cowboyish? So what about people that don't like sitting on hay bales? I mean, there's nothing wrong with hay bales. They're, they're more comfortable than pews. But you do have that straw on your clothes afterwards. I suggest you wear jeans, which fits in. But, I mean, there's nothing wrong with worshiping in a barn at all. In fact, the, the church I was pastored at in Bismarck here was, uh, that's where they began. And you know, somebody had a new barn, and they began worshiping there. Uh, until they built another one and burned it, down, <laughs> burned down the wood pile and had to go back and get more wood. And back in those days, they, you had to do things yourself. But uh, this was like, what, 1853 or something like that? That was, this was still a, well, the railroad had come through by then. But nevertheless, that well, that town, okay, the town today has like 500 people, about the same size it was when, when I was pastoring there. They had three churches of Christ and a Methodist church, three different sort of churches of Christ. Um, I was pastor of one of them. It wasn't a Campbellite church of Christ. It was not part of that. But uh, they had two Campbellite churches of Christ. One was instrumental, one was non instrumental. Then they had a Methodist Church of Christ, United Methodist, with a, a female pastor who had a, a husband that was an atheist. And I remember I was talking one day, and I think uh, the other one of the, the instrumental Church of Christ, uh, we, we knew each other, and sometimes we did things together. But. Uh, I was uh, uh, pretty naive about what some of the things were back then. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I, I loved Jesus. I thought, oh, but everybody else did too. And everybody else had, then I found something. The, the pastor had some very weird ideas that he got from a professor at his seminary. Like Jesus was rich. He was so rich he had to have a accountant to keep track of his money, Judas Iscariot. That comes right out of the prosperity gospel movement, too. <laughs> that excuse. Jesus was so rich, he had to, and he had a seamless garment, which was very expensive. Well, his mother made it for him. So just excuses for the flesh. That's what the prosperity movement is, excuses. Take the flesh and stamp it Christianized. Yeah, cater to the flesh and call it Christianity. That's what the prosperity movement is. The prosperity gospel is just catering to the flesh. <clears throat> so is a lot of other things. But he, he believed that. I said, really? Jesus said, I, I didn't have a—he I, I, warned, I, I have no place to son of man has no place to lay his hat. And he said, oh, that's just because uh, he, he was uh, traveling at the time. <laughs> This was a Church of Christ pastor. This was not a, a uh, prosperity guy. It's like, and it had leaked. These false doctrines had leaked into that. Well, that's not surprising in that denomination, but uh, because they have no gospel, I didn't. Wear, uh, but anyway, with the the uh, the the uh, pastorette from the uh, the Methodist Church. <sighs> For some reason, the, the Jesus Christ cross, his crucifixion came up in the conversation between the three of us. 
and I could, we were outside just talking, and, and she said, what's the big deal about Christ crucified? Lots of people are crucified. You know, sometimes you hear things like that, and, and you're just like, I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. I, I think I responded it's like, he was sinless. He was the son of God. It's like, she didn't believe any of it. She didn't believe it. She's a pastor, pastor, a pastor. I mean, I think too much is being made of women being pastors. That's not what the gospel's about, okay? I don't think it's right, Paul, but Paul grounds it in the creation order, not in the gospel. In Christ, you, you can make a case. In Christ, there is no male or female. So in heaven, that's not going to be an issue at all. But in the created order, it's like the man being the head of the household and things like that. It's part of the order God has. It's like government. It's part of the order God has ordained for this period because God is a God of order. And if God says he doesn't want women preaching, uh, exercising authority, he doesn't say he doesn't want them preaching. He says he doesn't want them exercising authority over the men in the congregation or teaching the men, which would be anything above 12 years old. There's a reason for that. And the reason has to do, I believe the reason has to do with interference in the, the order in the marriage, too. That the husband is the head of the wife, so he, he says to women who are speaking out, asking questions in the worship service, this is like a Jewish synagogue. It's not like a, a modern church uh, where people would question the pastor. Hey, pastor, you sure you're preaching the right thing there? Has anybody ever done something like that? Yeah, I have. Not quite in those words, but yeah, because I think, but doesn't the scripture say this? Some pastors don't like that. Others don't mind it. <laughs> Uh, it actually makes things more interesting, I think. I like that. I, I like responding to questions because if people have a question, my, isn't, isn't the job of the pastor to help answer those things biblically? But the, the women apparently were, were uh, doing this too. They were acting like the men. And the problem with that is, he, what is Paul's answer? Be quiet and wait till you get home and ask your husband because that's the proper way to do that and have your husband act as the pastor. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that... It, 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 certainly, there, my view is that we should give women all the liberty we can without violating explicit teaching in the Scripture because they are equal. I mean, women are... In God's sight, there's no male or female in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's just temporary. the temporary arrangement for this age is like God ordained government. And we're, su we're supposed to submit to that within boundaries, bounded submission, not unconditional submission. Just like wives, submit yourself to your husband. That's not unconditional. In the Lord, in the Lord. In other words, as long as it's within the boundaries of what the Lord desires or commands, you're supposed to submit within those boundaries. If your husband commands you not to believe in Christ or whatever, then you know, then he's a non-believer. And in those cases, if he wants to leave, let him leave. That's what the Scripture says. You're not bound. Marry somebody else in the faith, in Christ. You're free to marry in Christ because God has called us to peace. Remember that. God has called us to peace. So let's go on to another scripture. See, I don't know where I'm going to go with this stuff when I start. Who knows? All right, this is, has to do with the purpose of the church. It is a faithful saying. This is uh, Paul in his First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, he's writing to Timothy, these the two uh, pastoral letters here, to his 
his assistant, his ap apostolic assistant. Uh, this is a fa who carries the, the authority of the Apostle Paul here, too, because he's told to appoint deacons and elders. New churches, they don't have a track record. Uh, you have people there that, that are new believers. So uh, rather than them choosing people, in this case, the normal case would be an established church, the church congregation chooses who's going to be the pastors, elders, or deacons and they are accountable to the congregation as well as to God. That is biblical. Uh, but here, and that the, the, the idea of a congregational church is not a democracy, it's not the will of the people, it's the will of God. Since you have a regenerate congregation, people are supposed to seek the will of God and through the Holy Spirit bring consensus just like he did in Jerusalem when there was a question raised about uh, several times, do the Jews, do the uh, Gentiles have to be circumcised? And the Holy Spirit brought unity, and that's the evidence that it's God. But the, because you have a regenerate congregation with uh, everybody being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have a congregation that is not that, then it doesn't work well at all, because there will always be division, division over all kinds of things like the color of the carpet in the church. That is not a myth, by the way. Churches, the church that I went to serve, <clears throat> I was too eager sometimes to help. Had previously, they had um, remodeled the church, old building, and they had a feud over the carpet, whether it's going to be red or blue. Red because that's the color of the blood of Christ. Blue because that's the color of heaven. And they almost split over it. Almost split over that. What was driving that split? I mean, besides Satan, the flesh, the flesh. I want what I want. The, and the other side, well, I want what I want. And Satan is smiling. This is so easy. This is a faithful saying worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first... Jesus Christ might show all long suffering or patience as a pattern for those who were going to believe on him for everlasting life. What's that all about? First of all, he's reminding Timothy that the Christ came to save sinners. Pastors need to be reminded of that a lot. And secondly, that what Paul's talking about as him as chief, as a persecutor of the church as a model in order in other words this if if god would save me wretched sinner that i am he'll save anybody that was what paul was saying there in case you didn't get that if god's willing to save me he's willing to save you absolutely yeah, I, I would if I would have a discussion with Paul, it'd be like an argument over who is chief of sinners. I can remember before he saved me. There was a reason I ended up demon possessed. Uh, and once you once you start following that stuff, this is you know the, like the charismatic stuff. I mean, you you can get since you're listening to spirits. They will lead you down a path that will end in utter destruction. They will lead you into it. You will be inspired to do things, and they'll get more and more and more control of you until the day comes when you think there's something not right and you try to, to resist. Then you find out you've been possessed. When you show resistance to them, you will find out who's in control. And it's not you. So there's if you want to dabble in things, 
don't. Don't. Whether it's occultism or sci-fi or any of this stuff, the devil will use it to get you. He will get you. Why well, even bothers with people that are already sinners? I don't know. Unless he knows something we don't know. That like God has a particular purpose for somebody. It's like, uh, who knows? Somebody once upon a time might have dedicated you to God and you didn't know about it. But God, God took it seriously. Uh, actually, I think uh, dedicating uh, infants to, to God is a good idea. Like Samuel was dedicated. Actually, he was given to God. All right, so um, let's see. What was I going to go next? Oh, yeah. Remind, <laughs> my... My scripture verses here are sort of my outline, in a way. You know, I was thinking about uh, St Andy Stanley, and he's been falsely accused on some cases. He's some people have gone after him for preaching a false gospel, for for example. I looked at the at the video that they were using. I went back and looked at the context and everything else. That he was preaching a pretty decent gospel. Of course, Calvinists, they've got a completely different gospel anyway. It's called the eternal decree of all things. In Calvinism, you're not saved by Christ, uh, by the grace of God through faith in Christ. No, you're saved by the eternal decree. I don't, Christ really has no place in the Calvinist system. I don't know what, why they even bother with it, other than to deceive people. It's that bad. I mean, to deceive Calvin, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> now, that eternal decree thing, which doesn't come from Calvin, by the way. It comes from Augustine and others, and goes back to Aristotle and Aristotle's I the pagan Aristotle philosopher's idea of what hypothetically God would be like. Did Aristotle believe in God? No. Aristotle believed in Aristotle. He believed in his own thinking. I think who was his I think he was a student of Plato. Not be wrong there. Plato or Socrates. I think it was Plato. Never mind. The, the philosophers are just worthless. Worthless. The wisdom of the world is worthless. But <clears throat> I was thinking about Andy Stanley because I, I think he's gone too far now uh, as far as uh, uh, embracing uh, LGBTQs. The problem is that I'm not... I think Andy Stanley wants to see sinners saved. But he, his gospel is so shallow, he resorts to the flesh, just like his father, Charles Stanley, did. Uh, Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist gospel is incredibly shallow. Uh, it is uh, the, you know, once saved, always saved, make a decision for Christ. Billy Graham was a Southern Baptist or became a Southern Baptist because he had a larger potential audience there. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Billy either. If you're a big name, mm, so who promotes these people? Well, Billy Graham got puffed by a big newspaper publisher. He said, Puff Graham. That means all his newspapers were supposed to hype up Billy Graham. Why? Why would the world want to do that? Well, who does the world serve? If you're famous in this world... You don't get famous by following Christ. They nailed him to a cross. Don't forget that. And at one time when uh, he, they, they wanted him to, uh, to feed them again, he started driving them away, and only the 12 remained. He told them what they didn't want to hear. He wanted people that truly were dedicated to him to follow him, that actually were called by God. So, Andy Stanley, the problem with Andy is he try, he's trying to meet their needs with carnal means, seeker-sensitive. 
the the idea of trying to get sinners to come to Christ is not bad. It's just you're trying to do it with the ways of the world, you know, by giving them the the uh, Rick Warren, give them the music they like. Find how do, Rick Warren's mythology for planting a church is this. You you do a survey of the community. You you go and find out. You first of all you pick a prosperous, upwardly mobile community. Yuppie. You go to the yuppies. You know the young professionals that are going to have a lifetime of high income. Do you see a problem right there? You don't go to the inner city. You don't go to the poor. You don't go to the cities that are collapsing into decay. You go to those places that have a financial future. So what does that tell you about Rick Warren right there? People are so spiritually dumb that you can sell them anything. You can sell them a pig and a poke. A poke is a leather, little leather purse, you know, with drawstrings on it. You can say, well, I got a whole pig in this poke. That, that's what the meaning of that is. So you've got a, say, a 250-pound pig, a market-ready pig, uh, in this little leather purse, and I'll sell it to you at a discount. <laughs> that's what that that thing is, a pig in a poke. It's like the, the magic beans of Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, there's another example of that. Uh, but yeah, it's, you're telling them you're selling them a lie, like the uh, some what used to be like I've got some property for sale in uh, in Florida for you. Well, it was you know, swamp. Now that probably sells pretty high, but back then it was or br a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn. Yeah. <sighs> I remember in a nursing home, visiting the nursing home my mother-in-law was in, there was a lady there. Apparently, she had been a real estate agent. She was trying to sell me the nursing home. It'd be a good investment, she told me. <laughs> Didn't belong to her, but she was reverting to her. She, I thought that was rather humorous. But, uh, yeah, you run into all kinds of strange things in nursing homes. Anyway, uh, back to this, but the, I don't think, you know, I'm not opposed, you know, the, the people, the problem with the seeker-sensitive movement, it is they're trying to power it by the flesh, giving people what they want. You know, what uh, Rick warns, you go door to door, find out who's not attending church. If they're attending church, uh, thank you very much, and you go on the next, next house. So you find the non-attenders, and then you do a survey. Why, why aren't, could I ask you why you don't go to church? And then you, and then it's sort of like, if we had the kind of music you like to listen to, would you go to church then? If we had preaching that was practical and useful and helped you live your life, would you go to church then? Uh, do you like don't like the long services or what? What do you like? What would you? So you find out what they would like, and then you give that to them. What do sinners want, and you give them that practical sermons, contemporary music, you know, like if they're into into uh, uh, country music, you give them country. If they're into rock and roll, you give them Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or whatever. You just make it so it appeals to people that aren't saved. So you got the Church of the Unsaved. That's what you got. And then you have to keep giving them what they want or they'll leave <laughs> because they're not saved. If they were saved... Save people in your church, they'd flock out the door right away. This is, God's not here. I don't like this stuff. But why are you doing this? It's like, if, 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 you're, if you want those, you'd like those churches, it's, it's basically a testimony that you belong to the world because that's what those churches belong to. You're giving them the world. And if that's what you want, well, that's where you need to go. Fits right in typically with the Southern Baptists because they're a very worldly, cultural. It just happens to be Southern Baptists, institution kind of thing. It's it's uh, they're very different than fundamentalists, by the way. Um, very different than fundamentalists. Southern Baptists are very different. Uh, they are. 
carnal. They may love the Lord, but they're carnal. They're carnal. How do I know? I was pastored one. <laughs> Down in the border, yeah. They had English speakers, and we had uh, uh, the local uh, Mexican population down there. And so you had the Spanish-speaking church, and then we had also had the, the, the guy that started it was a so-called Southern Baptist missionary. Uh, he was a pilot. He used to drive, fly his plane, a small plane, out over the, the ranch lands and drop Sunday school material out of the plane to the remote places. Uh, which is an interesting idea. No, nothing wrong with that. But uh, then he became a pastor at this. Uh, there was a church plant from the large church in in um, McAllen, and they had this little church plant out in Reynosa or not Reynosa, Penitas, which is the oldest settlement in the United States, by the way. Uh, settled by the Spanish in fifteen something or other before before. Uh, uh, what it was the Virginia thing? Uh, it's, it's old. Nobody knows about it, but yeah, that was in the in the United States, continental United States. That's the oldest settlement, European settlement. But anyway, and the, so in this this church, so the the English speakers were they had all these campgrounds, uh, fifty five and older. Uh, People had uh, travel trailers, some mobile homes, even some houses there, like prefabs, in these big uh, 55 and older things. And they were people would go down there for the, uh, the the winter, or for part of the winter, and it was party time, uh, activities, bingo. They had their own bands and you know whatever else they did. <laughs> Some of it immorality. <laughs> uh, things you learn as a pastor, anyway. But it what they were that was what they were there for, and this was the church. This guy had sort of catered to it. This aviation missionary pastor uh, catered to them, and then because the locals were Spanish speaking. Then they ended up uh, having a Spanish pastor too, and that's that's where I learned about Southern Baptists quickly. They were there because if you cater to them, they'll come. If you don't, if you if you preach Christ, they don't want to hear it. They weren't there. They didn't go to church. They gave, you know, they went to church for. Community time, and then if they, if the sermon was too long, so they couldn't get to their favorite lo local restaurant before the crowd got there, they had a problem. That's Southern Baptists. It, one example, but that's pretty much it. Carnal. I'm not surprised. This Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley, that's what they are. So they're actually better at the gospel than most Southern Baptist churches. They're trying to reach out. They're just using carnal means because they don't know what the gospel is. Like Rick Warren, say this prayer. That's what Southern Baptists believe the gospel is. Say this prayer, believe in Christ, uh, believe that he died for your sins, and say this prayer. And if you meant it, you're saved. If you are sincere, you're saved because you said a prayer, because of something you did. Not because the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin, showed you how terrible you really are, and then in desperation, who will save this wretched sinner? Then reveals Christ to you, and you go, ah, wow. And you're in tears because you know that Christ died for this wretched man that I am. And because of what he did on the cross, all your sins are forgiven. You're, you're at peace with God. You're one of his children. Not because of what you did, but because of him, in spite of what you did. Because of what Christ did for you. 
But they don't... Their view of the gospel is so man-centered and impoverished that they use the things of this world. Charles Stanley would freely mix pop psychology or whatever into his sermons in order to help the congregation because he did not know what the gospel was. He didn't know anything about the New Covenant. They're dispensationalists. The old the Bible has the Old Testament doesn't say a single word about the church. That's their doctrine. They've been deceived by Satan. The more I think about it, yeah, the, the dispensationalism is satanic. So is Calvinism. But uh, see, who who can't I, who have I not offended? Shall I get to the Roman Catholics? You're worshiping an idol instead of God, the Pope. You, you know what does God have to do there? for you to realize that the Roman Catholic system can't save anyone. It hasn't saved the Pope. It hasn't saved the bishops. It hasn't saved the priest. Half of them are homosexuals, according to Catholics. If, it can't, if the priests can't save themselves through the system, how will you ever be saved there? You ever think about it? Ever think about that? I mean, there is no salvation there unless you just happen to have faith in Christ and him alone and don't listen to what the rest of the stuff tells you. You might be attending that church, but if you belong to Christ, but you'll feel like you're a little bit out of place. But do I recommend you go to a Southern Baptist church or a Fundamentalist Baptist church? No. No, I don't. The problem is, like two, Lutherans, B- Book of Concord. Well, actually, this is the, the, all the Lutheran confessions. The formula of Concord. This, this you know, the, the Baptists have the 1689 Calvinist Baptists, have the 1689 London Baptist Confession, G3. You have to, the pastor has to hold to this confession to be part of that new denomination. That's not a denomination, but it's a, it's a denomination. The Southern Baptists have their statement of, uh, uh, Whatever it was, 2000 statement of the confession of something. Of course, their confessions keep changing because social conditions change, so they change their confession because they're worldly. So their confession has to, they try to deal with uh, problems with doctrine. <laughs> no. So this is to be, if I were to join the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, I would have to agree with everything that's in here. Actually, everything that's in here. So this isn't enough. See, how much do I have to agree with in here, really? Well, the New Testament, which is that thick. What? I don't know how you can get beyond the revelation that's in the New Testament. I mean, you can study this for more than a lifetime, and it's only starting to get good. So that's not enough. So Protestants, Lutherans, Luther started it. Sola Scriptura. My conscience is bound by uh, Scripture and actually reason, he said. So uh, not by the teachings of Rome. So Lutherans come along and Sola Scriptura. Wait, wait a minute. Sola Scriptura. But plus this, how can you be a confessional, Bible-believing, sola scriptura Christian? Scripture alone as the sole source of faith and doctrine. And be 1689 London Baptist. And that's the standard. See, like G3, that is the standard of membership in their clique, in their denomination, their new denomination. Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, this is it. They've had more time to add material. Luther would have probably whacked them over the head with their book. He couldn't stand scholastics. He couldn't stand uh, the theologians. He couldn't stand them. The people that did this, he would have used this on them. 
Luther could be a little erratic, inconsistent, but nevertheless, he preached Christ. But for me to say, if, if what really irks me, okay, so you even got this. The LCMS, Luther Church, Missouri Senate, they're Bible-believing, they hold to Scripture, um, th th they've not joined the world like the ELCA did. <sighs> evangelical Lutheran, ev evangelical. That's some, if somebody should sue them for misuse of that name. Uh, evangelical sort of comes from Luther because he called his preachers even uh, preach evangelicals because they preach the evangel, which is another name for the gospel, the good news. Well, you don't. They don't preach that at the ELCA. <laughs> they're they're false advertising. <sighs> Unfortunately, those words aren't copywritten or patented or whatever. But I, the, the, what really bothers me, you know, in some ways, I. It's liturgical. I don't mind the service. Even it's a little different than what I was used to. But it's a tri-center. And the preacher, the pastor there focuses. You'll, you'll hear Christ crucified. I, you know, it, definitely. It's a center. It's Christ-centered. However, I can't worship there. I can't participate in communion, which is Central. I think it's communion served there every th every time. I think at least twice a month. I think at the church I was raised in, they they usually did it twice a month, or the church I you sort of was raised in, on and off, twice a month. I believe it was, and they treat it seriously. But I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. And I've had this discussion with the pastor, and I, I gave him, this is how I understand it, and I can back it up with Scripture. But because I'm not of that particular clique, I'm not, I couldn't wholeheartedly agree with this. I would judge this and say, yeah, I can agree with this, this, this. No, that's wrong. They're wrong there. They're wrong there. They're wrong there. By Scripture. Even though they say that Scripture is the authority. No, it's this. This is the standard of fellowship. Just like G3 Network, which is that new denomination, 1689 London Baptist Confession and $500 a year is the standard of fellowship. Not Christ. How can you be a confessional solo scriptura church? Because the confession is the standard. Just like Rick Warren was kicked out of the Southern Baptist, or the church there, uh, whatever that church was called over there now, a saddleback. Yeah, that was the yuppie area he chose, saddleback. Uh, because by ordaining uh, a pastor and his wife as a leadership team, they violated the uh, Southern Baptist standard, which isn't even their confession, the 2000 confession, which isn't even binding on local churches. Normally, you just have to send them some money every year, and they'll let you stay. <sighs> Back to Andy Stanley, which is a whole lot better than Rick Warren. Again, I think he's probably gone too far on the LGBTQ, but the difference is, again, what did the Apostle Paul say to Timothy. He said, remember, Christ has come into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, I'm the worst of the bunch. So if Stanley is reaching out to the current generation that accepts LGBTQ and it's going this direction, going the, the path of Sodom, what is the difference between that two and any an idolatry, which is abomination, and worse even than that? The love of money is worse than the LGBTQ stuff. Do you hear that preached in the churches? The love of money being idolatry. Do you hear that in the churches? Have I ever heard that in the churches? No. No. 
It's like the new covenant. Why haven't I? I was. Why, why haven't I heard the new covenant proclaimed? The real new covenant. See, the, the churches all saw the new covenant. That's the same as the New Testament. Well, you can find it in there, but what is it? What is it? The New Testament is just a a a, a title we give to the to the uh, gospels and the uh, epistles. The New Testament, the really the New Testament, is the New Covenant, which was prophesied in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And is referred to explicitly in Hebrews, which most people don't even preach. That is the power of God, the promises of God, what God does in salvation. And salvation is of the Lord. It is all about what God does in you through faith in Christ. You believe in him, and he does the work. That's a, the new covenant. That is why it is the good news. Because you don't have to do it. God does it. And Southern Baptists believe that a little bit. Fundamentalists believe it a little bit. But they don't believe in living by faith in the promises of God. They don't know what the promises are. Why? Because if If you believe that, then you won't go to a Southern Baptist church. Because, because, if, because the Southern Baptists are powered by flesh, not spirit. It's by flesh, not by faith, by works. Just like fundamentalists. I'm talking about a lifetime of experience now. They're, they're powered by flesh, by living by principles. Oh, yes, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. That's an event. That's like an event, like a period. Okay, there. Yeah, we're, we're born again. So once you get out of the birth canal, then you have to live by principles. It's not funny. It's not really funny at all. And living by principles has no power at all to deliver you from sin. And there, these churches are demonstrated. We, we talk about Bickle and the crazy charismatics and the crazy prophets and apostles. The same thing happens in fundamentalist Baptist churches and Southern Baptist churches and probably every denomination. Trying to live by the power of the flesh rather than by faith in God and his promises. Living day by day. The just, or let me rephrase that, the justified, because we, that's the just, the justified, the those who justified by faith, live by faith. We live by faith in Christ and what he did for us every day. It's not just being saved. Being saved is simply the beginning of a new life of faith in Christ. They don't do it that way. Oh, I was saved back in 1949. I remember the day. Are you walking in Christ today? Is the Holy Spirit in you? If not, you aren't saved. What is God doing in you? Oh, you mean he does things? I thought I have to do all that stuff. I tried sanctifying myself. It didn't work, so I gave up on that. Yeah, I, I just decided to be a good old, a, a saved good old boy, drinking whiskey and rye. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Uh, uh, Southern Baptists. Saved by faith, but not living by faith. No power, no power in their lives. And that's the problem with Andy Stanley. The fact that he's reaching out to the current generation, how he's doing it, what he's offering them is wrong. That's why, that's why Andy Stanley is trying to embrace them flesh in the flesh, just like his father, offering comfort 
in man's wisdom because he doesn't know about the power of God. And he is ignorant of the new covenant. If he were to begin, if he would come to understand the promises of God in Christ in the new covenant, it would transform his ministry, and he would actually have something to give to the people he's trying to uh, save. You get them to come to your church, good. Give them the new covenant. God will transform their lives. Most of the other Baptists out there, they're, they're like, bring them to the church, we'll beat them with a stick until they submit. That's not God's way. They're a bunch of you know Pharisees. You know what the Pharisees were? People that added their own teachings to the Word of God. Sola Scriptura, except for this. This works good because it's big. <laughs> okay, where do I got this? Oh, I misplaced it. Oh, here they are. Okay. <sighs> Now, G3, rather than this to be the standard of fellowship, this is the standard of fellowship. 1689 London Baptist Confession. This is, you have to believe this to be part of our clique. We divide the, Christ, the body of Christ by this. This is our standard. To be with us, do you have to belong to Christ? No, you just have to belong to this. There's no standard. Uh, uh, you have to hold to this. Not hold to Christ, hold to this. Sola Scriptura. This, this, these things themselves will say, the sole standard of faith and practice, just like the, the, the ba Southern Baptist Faith and Message, 2000 Faith and Message. Are, the, sole, uh, the Bible is a sole standard of faith and practice, except for our confession, which you have to hold. Yeah. <sighs> Is this all lies? No, it's not. <laughs> but this, if, if this is a standard, don't tell me you're a sola scriptura. You're not. This is your standard of fellowship. Not whether a person's saved. You can be sola scriptura and go to hell. If, if I can say, yep, this is my sole standard. I break it all the time, but it's my sole standard of faith and practice. I mean, Sola Scriptura, this is the only written Word of God. Okay, so what? Am I saved? That doesn't have anything to do with it. Why do I, why do I trust in this? Because God saved me, that's why. A person doesn't have to believe this stuff to be saved. They just have to be saved to believe it. The Bible's not written for sinners. It's written for saints. The instruction in the epistles are for saints, not for sinners. Crazy people. What does Paul say to the church at Corinth here? First Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse nine, you've all heard this. Do you not know that this is right after he scolds them? For they're fighting among themselves. They're suing each other. Talk about Southern Baptists. Suing each other in court before the ungodly, before the world. Go into the courts of this world for disputes among brethren. Let me just bring that up so it literally bring it up here. Uh, so <sighs> he says, I say this to your shame. Uh, it is so that there, uh, is there not a why? What did he say here? I don't want to read all that. He talks about judging in the church. I, I say this to your uh, shame. Is it not so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who is able to judge between his brethren? Disputes in the church. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before the unbelievers exclamation point. Not in the Greek, but yeah. Uh, Paul's upset about this. They are going, they're taking their disputes before the judges of the world. 
You know how many lawsuits there are in the Southern Baptists between the different instruments of the Southern Baptists fighting about who controls this and who controls that and who this church belongs to and all this stuff? They go to court. They go to the courts of, of the world, even though the Scripture explicitly denies that. Don't do that with an exclamation point. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers, unbelieving judges. Yeah, uh, and testimony of the world. Southern Baptists are disgrace to the kingdom of God. Disgrace all the time. They're always doing this. I didn't know that until I became a pastor there, and we got these denominational newspapers like, really? These people don't follow Christ at all. It was the scandal. I was scandalized by what was going on there. I'm not talking about in that particular uh, congregation, but against uh, the Southern Baptist denominational structure. And the, the, the local ones, the, uh, in fact, the, the, they had two different Southern Baptist state organizations at that time. And there was a fight I remember a fight at the local meeting, meeting of the regional one about whether or not they could get support from both. It's like, if you're either with us or you're with them, if you're with them, we're not going to give you any money for your church. Any help? Yeah, lots of help. <clears throat> it was awful. Personal testimony. And then the church that the meeting was in, it was draped out with flags. They had more flags than the uh, Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July. They had this huge flag at the front of the church uh, where uh, in traditional churches in the back, you'd have a, a curtain you know, behind the altar. They had a huge American flag. I mean, it's up to the ceiling, from the platform to the ceiling. And then every window was decorated with flags, American flags. I walked into this, what, what is this? This is a Christian church. I don't think that flag has any business in any Christian church, period. I don't think, unless you want to put a flag from every nation, I suppose then it'd be okay. But American flag on a platform, really? No, 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 no. Doesn't belong there. Can't you see that? Are you so worldly that you can't see that? There, there's that Christian nationalism stuff too. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Utterly failed. That's Southern Baptist. I imagine this goes on other places, too. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated than, than to create the, do this sinful, wicked thing of going to court against your own brethren in front of the world, in front of the judges of the world? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren! Exclamation point. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall... See, that's when it breaks into this. So what's Paul saying to them? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This, remember the context here. Do you not... Do not be deceived... Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, past tense, some of you. Such were, not are, were, past tense, some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
What's he saying? Why aren't you walking in Christ, you dumb people? You're walking in the flesh. You may be in Christ, but you're walking in the flesh, not the Spirit. You're not walking by faith. You're walking by the flesh. That's why they're suing each other. God had delivered them from all these things. So salvation is supposed to, you were some of these. Some of you were thieves and drunkards and revilers and extortioners and idolaters and fornicators and homosexuals and adulterers and sodomites and da 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 You were. You understand? The power of the gospel saves you from this stuff. It sets you free. The promises of the new covenant, the new heart, the new spirit. God writing his commandments on your heart. The spirit, the spirit of God in you. That is what Andy Stanley ought to be delivering to the people he's trying to get in his church. He's reaching out to them with a impoverished gospel. A little bit of gospel but not all the gospel, not the power of God unto salvation. Just forgiveness, get you into heaven. Won't deliver you from your sins, won't deliver you from bondage, won't deliver you from a wicked lifestyle that will prevent you from entering the kingdom of God. It's not really salvation at all. It's just a say-so salvation. We, we say, we say that this is what you have to do. That'll get you into heaven. But Paul says, those who practice these things will not enter the kingdom of God. So when somebody, say Andy Stanley's doing this, I don't, he seems to be going this route. So a pastor comes along and embraces you and your sin and says, wonderful, you're accepted here. You can abide here. But doesn't tell them that those who practice these things go to hell. But guess what? Our salvation, the power of God is such, he will deliver you from any of these and more. See, Stanley doesn't know anything about the power of God. He doesn't know anything about the real gospel. He doesn't know anything about the new covenant. Neither does his father, Stanley. <laughs> Charles, nor Andy, nor Rick Warren. I mean, the, 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 the Southern Baptists are devoid of this. Even the Calvinists are devoid of this. That's why they're trying to create Christian nationalism. They think they can save the world through the law. They're that far off. If Stanley really cares about the people he's trying to bring to his church, he has to deliver what Christ promises. Because that is the gift of God. That is the salvation of God. Without that... They'll die in their sins. A prayer will not get them into heaven unless they cry out to God to save them from their sin, to save them from their wickedness. You trying to seduce them into the kingdom of God will not save them. One could almost say there's no salvation in the Southern Baptists. Their doctrine will not save you. Their Baptist faith and message will not save you. The kind of gospel that's pre usually preached among them will not save you. It'll create a church filled with carnal people that think they're going to heaven. When they're not, there'll be a lot of surprise Southern Baptists. Well, my preacher told me I was saved. And Christ will say, I did not know that man. Why did you believe him instead of me? We're talking about some very serious issues. And denominations, by their very natures, are an offense to God. 
dividing his people up based on their own personal preferences. Excluding people from the Lord's Supper because they won't accept your man-made doctrines, you bunch of Pharisees. Because that's what the Pharisees did. You have to believe their doctrine, the opinions of men. If you've ever read the Baptist Faith and Message, you'll find there's all kinds of things in there that have nothing to do with the Bible. Like value of education, for example. Things like that. Social statements. What does Jesus Christ have to, Christ have to do with those things? Making them binding for fellowship. Really? I don't think so. Christ in you is sufficient for fellowship. If you have him in you, you are in his church. If you don't, you're not. That is the standard of fellowship. Nothing else. It is supernatural. It is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. Christianity, real Christianity, is 100% supernatural. But it has to be his spirit. He is the one who saves. Salvation is indeed of the Lord. He does the work. The sinner, in his sin and for his own self-interest, has the power to cry out to God to save him. But that's all he can do. Then God saves you and gives you a new life. You become a new creature in Christ, created in him. And you are restored to the image of God, at least partly. We're still in these unregenerate bodies, these unredeemed bodies. But we become the very temples of God. We fulfill God's purpose as being his dwelling place. And we're called to be the light of the world. And you can only be the light of the world if you walk in Christ by faith. If you walk in the flesh, you become darkness. doesn't mean you're lost. You're walking in the flesh, living by the flesh rather than by faith. You have to live by faith in order for the promises of the new covenant to be visible in you, to be fulfilled in you, to be present in you. Otherwise, you're walking in the world. You will have a very frustrating Christian life if you're saved and try to walk in the world, try to walk in the flesh. It, was, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The, just, the justified shall walk by faith. That's the only way it works. God has ordained that. That he has decreed, that the just shall live by faith.